And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. I get contacted about once a week from different people who have made different prototypes of games and they want me to review their prototype. And I don't do that for a variety of reasons, but mostly because I just don't have time to look at everybody's prototype. I don't do it also because I like to review finished games. However, I will work as a consultant for a board game company. I will take a look at your prototype if you pay me, give you as much feedback as I possibly can, and if you want me to, I'll make a video that previews it for something like, let's say, Kickstarter. And that's what this is. So take all that with a grain of salt. Whenever I do one of these videos, I'm completely honest. I'm telling you exactly what I think. But this is not a review here. This is a preview of a game called Dark Horse. Uh, from the, the candidate term, from the guy coming from behind. And it has a Wild West kind of theme uh, with some dice placement. And so what I'm doing here, uh, even though I, th I think you know, I'm, I'm going to be colored by the fact that I like the game. Uh, and also, quite a few of my ideas that I had about the game uh, have been incorporated into the design. I'm about to show you the game. And uh, what I want you to realize is that this is not the finished product. This is just a, a very nice little prototype. Different artwork is going to be coming. A lot of things are different. So I have a board with stickers on and so on. But this is to give you an idea. So you might be interested into going and getting involved with this at Kickstarter. Uh, giving money to the designer so he can publish it. And then you get a gift and, or what have you. So check that out. But first let's take a look at the game and I'll tell you how it works. Again, I want to remind you that this is kind of just a mock-up of how the game works. Uh, the, the, these are components are not final. It's just a, a nice looking prototype so you can see basically how the game goes. Each player is going to get a bunch of pieces in their color. Each player gets two dice. There's also a bonus die that you have, but you can set that die aside really because you know you can only get the die when you get a bonus die. You also have cities and towns. Now when you're on you're gonna be putting these on the board. What a city does is it allows you to get towns on the board. Cities are worth points at the end of the game. They're worth points for every resource that they are attached to. Both directly, like you can see this city here is next to these two resources. So there are some resources that are pre-printed on the board and next to this resource. So here it's next to two foot food and one wood. There's only three resources in the game. Food, wood, and ore. Let's see if I can find an ore. Uh, here's an ore piece. And then there's also gold. Gold's not a resource, but you can get gold through other means, and gold's worth a victory point at the end. Cities are going to be worth points for resources that they're attached to, either directly or with trains, so you can build a railroad track, basically, that will connect you to other resources. And that's one of the main ways to get points during the course of the game. Towns, on the other hand, they are placed adjacent to a city, or connected to a city, like this, connected through a railroad, and they're going to give you the resources of the area that they're built on. So when I collect resources, I can collect them from any place I have a town. A town will cost different amounts. Notice this resource here says rugged, and that costs more to put a town onto a rugged territory. But this is basically the way that the board starts, and there's you know some randomness because those tiles are placed face down. What players are going to do each turn of the game is they're all going to roll their dice. And then in turn order, players are going to place their dice that they rolled on the board, depending on what they've rolled. You may have noticed this similar mechanic in Kingsburg and other games such as that. And they're going to place these around this side of the board. You can put two together and put them on different things. And let me show you some of the places that you can put them on. We'll start at the end. Okay, 12, if you put yours on 12, you get a, a gold and you get to put a railroad track out on the board. Well, that's pretty good. On 11, you get a stock. Now, a stock is useful because uh, a stock token, and there's little tokens that you can get. Stocks are one of the tokens you can get in this game. And you can trade that in for resources at any time. If you look at the mayor, number 10, so if I rolled a 6 and a 4 on my turn, I'm, I, like I said, I can put both of them here on the mayor. Uh, that gives me a victory point in any two resources. On 9, a scout. That lets me go through uh, the deck of cards and take the top three, keep one of them, put the other two on the bottom of the pile. Uh, number eight, plus one turn order. That means you are going to move in turn order and get to go first. And obviously in this game, going first is good because you will be able to place your dice on something before someone else. And seven, 
the trader that lets you trade resources. You can trade any four of your resources for any two. Or you can trade any four resources in for a gold or for uh, a loan, which, you know, or, or you can take a loan by going on the trader. I'm sorry. And then the builder, this is the big one. This is the one that people are going to want. The builder, you can pay two food and one wood to put out a town, or four wood and a gold to put out a city. And then the rail baron, you can put two stone and a food out to place two railroad tracks on the board. The work crew, which is a four, lets you produce any two different resources. The politics, which is a three, simply gives you a victory point. Clout, which is a two, gives you your bonus die. So next round, you're going to be rolling three dice instead of two. If you roll one, you may place that with another die. So let's say I roll one and a five. I can place both of them here to draw the top card of the pile. And if I have nothing else to do, I can put any die on these spots. However, when I put a die in this spot, that shows that I'm, all my towns that are on food will produce one food. All my towns that are on ore will produce one ore. All my towns that are on wood will produce one wood. So the more towns, the more powerful this spot is. And then here's another spot. You need a 10 or higher to put it here, but you get to go first and you get the sheriff card. The sheriff card will make you immune to negative uh, events or to get rid of an event in play. And then the turn order, I can put any die that's three or higher here. And when I do that, the first person to do that will go in turn order next turn. So there's different ways to get turn order. Over here, I should mention, you can always put a die to add or subtract one to one of your other dice. So let's say I want to be the rail baron, which is... Uh, I'm sorry, not the rail baron, the builder. I want to build something, and I've only rolled a five. Well, I could place my one here, and then my five on the builder, because that adds one to that die. Or I can subtract one doing that. And then, of course, I can put one die down here to trade any three resources for one resource or any six resources for gold. It's not as good as the trader, but it's always possible to be done. Now, if you look at these spots, let's take a look here at these three spots. This one here has this dotted line around the outside. That means any number of people can go there. So anybody can go draw a card. This one, however, has a solid line around it, which means if I put a two there, then no one else can put a two on that spot. So if I put a two there, then too bad. No one else can put one there. So there's several, most of the spots are like that. Only a few spots can multiple people put their dice on. And if you notice, politics, work, crew, and rail baron, they have a picture of a die instead of a number, which means you need to put that exact number down. You can't manipulate it through that other die. And there's other ways to manipulate things too. If you notice way back here in Endeavor, you get one of these tokens and you can also, whenever you roll doubles, you get one of these tokens that you can play later on to add or subtract one from your die roll. So this is the game. You are basically going to spend each turn as quickly as you can. The game is going to end when one player gets to 11 points. So you can see that the spots on the outside of the board that are worth a point are very useful. Getting gold is very useful. But even more importantly, when the game ends, when someone gets 11 points, that's not the end of the game because you're going to score points for every city you have on the board that's connected to resources. So having a network of cities can really net you a lot of points because each city could be worth quite a few points if they're connected to the resources. The cards are very useful. Many of the cards are cards that you can keep in your hand, uh, like this card here. Take the first turn order, draw five cards from the action card deck, keep one card and place the rest back. Or lose one influence point, uh, or skip your next turn to receive a free town. So you can do one of those two things to receive a free town. Uh, the, other cards are event cards. When this happens, like this says, building rails cost one additional ore. Bonus, you may immediately take the rail baron action without penalty, even if someone else has. What this means is it's an event that affects everybody except the sheriff. Also, you may, the person who drew the event card, since they don't get something cool, they get to do this. So this person gets to do the rail baron. You would then place this event thing here around the rail baron so everyone can remember that all rail cost an extra ore. There can only be one event in play at any given time, so either the sheriff can, you know, give up the sheriff card to get rid of an event, or everybody can, you know, if you put another event card out, it will cancel that first event. Another really interesting part of the game is that each player can start with a predetermined 
role, basically. We have the cowboy, the preacher, the outlaw, the tracker, the gambler, and the banker. Each of these guys has something different that they start with. The cowboy starts with different resources. The preacher starts with nothing, but he starts with a point. The outlaw starts with a lot of resources. The tracker starts the game with some tokens and so on. And then they have different special abilities. But there's more than one. Like the cowboy here has three different special abilities. Like if he's the sheriff at the end of the game, he gets a victory point. Uh, while also if he, take, he can take the sheriff on an 8 plus action rather than the 10 plus that it says now. And what I really like is on the back of each card it tells you who they are, tells you what they do, and it tells you how to play it. And you know what kind of player might want to play each of these. And so this adds a lot to the game, all right? This, when you play one of these characters, because your play style is going to be different than everyone else's. The game is very simple and easy to understand. People are going to understand the gathering of resources and putting the cities and towns out. It might remind you of Settlers of Catan, and it actually has a bit of a feel to that. But here you get resources when a town's on it, but only when you roll the die. If I could describe this, it would be a bit of Kingsburg mixed with a bit of Settlers of Catan. And, uh, but there's some more to it than that. I think the theme is fairly strong when it comes to the cards and the roles. Because the cowboy, you know, everyone has different roles. I, I like the fact that the preacher can't be ever become the sheriff or the outlaw. He can do things to steal stuff from other players. It, it just, it, it works together. Now, everything that I've shown you here, not everything is going to be the same. Like, uh, clout might change, I think, to deputy. And there's different things that are changed in the works but overall it's interesting you know you want to if you get a two you can say hey i get the bonus die but if you roll high do you want the tycoon or maybe you want to split your dice and take two smaller things and so there's a lot of different things going on in the game so if you think this game is interesting then i'm recommending that you go to uh, kickstarter.com and look up dark horse you can see the rule book here yeah, this is it, it's there's a lot of rules, but they're very clearly explained at this point in time. And the game is for one to four players. You can play it solitaire if you want, and it takes about 30 to 90 minutes. So that's Dark Horse. It's up to you. Do you want to support this game? Then check it out. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.